guys, it's Amelia and welcome back to my channel. So today is going to be a little bit of a different video than I normally make. It's not going to be crafting. Today's video is about my summer practicum placement at an inpatient hospital setting. So I'm in grad school for speech language pathology and that involves three practicum placements in a clinical setting to gain experience before I take all the tests and get officially certified as a speech therapist. So this summer I have been at a hospital doing um, four days a week of therapy following around the speech therapist at the hospital and it has been a super incredible learning experience and I thought I would share a little bit about it. When I first found out that I was going to be at a hospital and do inpatient therapy, I was really really nervous. I didn't really know what it was going to look like and I like YouTubed like inpatient hospital day in the life and I couldn't find a lot of videos and so I'm making this video so that hopefully anybody who's watching you are someone who is just like me who has a placement like this and tried to find a video with information. So I'm just gonna share my experience of the hospital that I'm at and I hope that it helps. So I just literally came in the door from my second to last day at my placement. Tomorrow is my last day, which I have mixed feelings about because number one, I'm really excited for a break. Um, but number two, there's definitely gonna be things that I miss about my hospital placement, which I honestly did not expect because when I started, I didn't like it. I'll be honest, I did not like it. It was really fast-paced and stressful and there was everything was new. It was a lot, so I did not like it. But as time went on, I actually really started enjoying myself and there are parts I'm gonna miss about my placement. So I couldn't take you guys like into the hospital and film like a day in the life, but a typical day, I get there at eight o'clock, so I, I park in the student parking lot. Um, they provided me with a parking pass, thankfully. So I walk to the hospital, I pack a lunch, I bring a tote bag, which I'll show you what I bring um, to the hospital. I bring hot tea and then use it to drink water throughout the day because you gotta stay hydrated. My supervisor will get there and she'll arrange the board. So there's a board up on the wall with little tags that are magnetic, um, that are dry erased, and they write down the names of all the patients that have orders for speech therapy. Um, and then they organize them under like categories like if they're a meal follow-up or if they're a new order um, and then they organize them under the names of the speech therapists that are there that day so usually at the hospital that I was at there are two to three speech therapists usually two and then myself as a student and then there was another grad student as well we'll call her Kay. Kay literally changed my life like I could not have done this my supervisor will get there and she and the other speech therapists will rearrange the names, put people under different lists, and decide on the official list for the day. And we usually keep all the patients that we've been seeing previously and then just add new ones as they come in. We write down all of the patients' names under my therapist's name. I want to show you a student sheet, but I will put a student sheet on the screen. This is what my hospital uses for students. So every morning we take one of these sheets, we fill it out, patient name, their room number, reason for seeing, and then I make sure to write down the patient's age, gender, what diet they have right now, and then why are they here in the hospital? And then like any medical history that might be pertinent. And if I'm doing a cognitive evaluation or an aphasia evaluation, I'll write down their birthday because that's a question on the eval and I would have no idea if they got it right if I didn't write it down from their chart. And then of course you write your time in and your time out of each patient's room. Your supervisor will do that for billing purposes, but you do that for um, logging your hours on Calypso. So patients that we typically see are anybody who's having difficulty swallowing. We also do fees. So my supervisor is certified to do fees. So I can't do a fees, but I'll feed the patient while she's feesing them and modified barium swallow studies. And then a lot of stroke patients. We do cognitive evaluations for stroke patients, aphasia evaluations, um, dysarthria evaluations, voice evaluations, which I've actually never had to do a voice evaluation, but we do that as well if needed. After you evaluate the patients, you'll decide if they're appropriate for therapy, and you can put that in your note, and then you'll start seeing them three to five times a week, usually three because there's so many patients, and you'll see them for therapy. So then we do therapy for all of those things that we do evals for, dysarthria, dysphagia, cognition, um, voice. Uh, we've also seen multiple total laryngectomies, and then trach patients, so we do PMV tolerance. If you don't know what PMV is, it's Casimir valve. I'll put it up on the screen. What else do we do? 
I don't know. I think that's pretty much it. So that's what we do every day. And every day looks different. We've gotten more and more hands-on as time goes by. So when you get there in the morning, we spend about an hour looking at patients. And then we discuss the patients that we've looked up with our supervisor to make sure that we know exactly what we're gonna be doing with them. And of course, at the beginning of the semester, we would get a lot of information wrong or we would miss information or we would have outdated information. But now that it's the end, it's pretty seamless. We just talk to our supervisor and we pretty much always know what's going on because we know how to look patients up now. Do evaluations first. So anybody who cannot eat right now who is NPO, um, you would do a bedside on, a bedside swallow study. You go downstairs to their room. Well, for us, it's downstairs. You go to their room from the rehab department, wherever it is. Then you're gonna do a bedside swallow study. So at our hospital, it looks like giving them PO trials, which means trials by mouth of ice chips, water, you start with spoon, go to cup, go to straw. Um, if necessary, you can do nectar thick liquid. Um, you could do honey thick liquid if necessary, but usually we go from water to puree, which is an applesauce, and then to pudding, which is puree as well, but a thicker consistency, and then mixed, which is a little container of pears, and then um, solid, which is either a Lorna Dune cookie or a graham cracker. And you have the patient say, ah, before PO trials, and then in between each PO trial, you have them say, ah, to analyze vocal quality, to see if there's wet vocal quality, because that would mean possible aspiration penetration. Um, you watch their respiratory rate. It still is very intimidating to do bedside swallow studies just because every patient is so different and I kept wanting to have an outline and like the same, what I just described to you, I wanted to do every single thing with every patient, but that's not what you're gonna do. So if someone is having really, really extreme dysphagia, you might start with ice chips. If they're not, you might start just with water by cup. If they're medium, you might start with water by spoon. So it's very different, very intimidating at first, but that's the basic outline um, that they follow at the hospital and you kind of just change it up as you go. And of course, my supervisor was always with me when I did bedside swallow studies just to make sure that I was doing everything appropriately, that I wasn't um, doing anything that would harm the patient because as a student, I might not know something. So that's a bedside. So you would do that. And then you also do any other evaluations like cognition, aphasia, dysarthria, voice, any evaluations that orders have been put in. So then after evaluations, you would do treatments and then modified barium swallow studies in the afternoon. So you'd need to get any appropriate doctor's orders because you can't just like do things willy nilly. You gotta have orders from the doctor to do them. And then you do treatments. I am going to now dive into what's in my tote bag. What do I take with me to the hospital every day? Number one is a jacket because it's, the temperature is always fluctuating. So it's literally freezing and then really hot and it, you never know. So I bring a jacket. And also I wear scrubs to my placement, which not gonna lie, I kind of love. I know some people don't like scrubs, but I love them to be honest. Okay, so then I have this clipboard. Let me take everything off. I have a clipboard with um, a pocket in it. Very, very important because inside I keep all the evaluations and therapy materials that I've used so far and I keep them in this binder. But anything I think we're gonna use during the day, I can just put in here and then have easy access as I'm going to patients' rooms, which is really, really helpful. And I'll show you what I have in here in a second. So then I have a binder, which I made before my practicum started of things that I was like, I think I'm gonna need this. But then as my placement went on, I learned what I did need and what I didn't need. And my supervisor gave me a ton of materials of what they do at the hospital. And I organized them all in here. Then I have an umbrella because it's poured the rain down multiple times and I have to walk to the parking lot. So very important. Then my wallet, of course, a crap ton of pens and markers and highlighters. <laughs> Something that um, me and Kay did that was extremely helpful was we laminated all of our evaluations. It's been so helpful because you can just take your evaluation, you can take a dry erase marker, you could go do an evaluation, go upstairs, write the note, wipe it off. Super, super helpful because then you're not printing and throwing away and you just always have the same evaluation. So if you have access to a laminator, I 100% suggest laminating your assessments and things that you're gonna be using daily. And then having different colored dry erase markers because then you can do multiple assessments in a row and just have each patient have different colors and then you'll know how to write your notes. A hand sanitizer because necessary. 
Um, then I also have a bunch of extra, oh, Advil. <laughs> you never know when you're gonna need Advil. Then I also have um, a bunch of extra masks. Then I have my student name tag. We all get name tags that you're required to wear during your placement to identify yourself as a graduate student. And of course, when you go into a room, you introduce yourself as a graduate student to the patients. But I wear that every day. And then I think that's everything I have in here. Um, so let's look at what's inside my binder and my clipboard. Okay, so let's start with the clipboard. It's gonna be a little unorganized because I literally just walked in the door. Don't even remember what's in here, but let's find out. So, like I said, my supervisor gave me and Kay a ton of materials that she uses in the hospital. So there's a bunch of informal assessments that she and other speech pathologists at the hospital have written up, made specifically for assessing different things. So I will show you what we have, but every hospital, I'm assuming, will be different. So the first thing I have in here are some modified barium swallow study example documents so basically my professor professor <laughs> my supervisor printed out a modified barium notes with no patient information and then we can use this as a template when we're writing notes note writing is something that i was really nervous about when i went in but it's just really helpful to just familiarize yourself with whatever program you use the hospital that i'm at uses epic to write notes so just familiarize yourself with how to look at the speech orders how to look up notes and um, your supervisor will tell you how to do that. Mine did and she also was very helpful whenever we had questions. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions even when you know you're wrong because you're there to learn so you might as well just learn. Okay, so we had those because I wrote a modified note today and I needed an example. Then I have some blank pieces of paper that we use for the Western aphasia battery which is an assessment for people with expressive and receptive language deficits. Then I have a bunch of therapy materials. How we plan treatment is we use these books which I'll put on the screen. So they have them at the hospital and then there's a copy machine and we just make copies of um, what we need and then I keep the copies because I know we're gonna need them again for other patients. The things that we uh, do therapy for typically are cognition with these books and then some aphasia but it's a lot of cognition so here's just a piece of paper from one of the books I can't remember which book but it's um, naming categories so this is what it looks like we just made a copy and this would be helpful for verbal fluency so you'd say um, I want you to name all the fruits that you can in one minute and then if what kind of cues they need do they need phonemic cues which would be like the first letter or sound of the word or do they need semantic cues which would be more like describing the situation that the word would be used in that's one example um we also do um i have inferences i have abstract expressions convergent thinking so that would be i'll say three words tell me the category they belong to cup bowl saucer and the patient would say dishes and then they would get um, a correct point for accuracy. So that's how we usually take the data. Then there's math for functional uh, problem solving. Then there's um, new learning, which is like you read them a story and then they have to answer questions about the story. So there's different new learning activities that we do. And then what else is in here? Um, oh, my dysphagia notes. Um, from class orientation and memory so there's some yes no questions so there's like yes no questions so that's all the therapy materials that I have in my clipboard and I just keep these in my clipboard because at the beginning of the day we plan therapy but then throughout the day we might not go back upstairs before seeing a cognitive therapy patient and I just want to have everything with me I had some evaluations that were also on my clipboard so I have our informal aphasia evaluation so this is what it looks like I don't think it would be helpful necessarily to share it because every hospital is different and also my supervisor like made this specifically so I don't know if I should just hand it out to people so I will show it to you if you're interested um, but I'm not gonna like put it in the description or anything um, and then informal dysarthria evaluation these were formatted differently my supervisor just kind of had them in um, sentence form across the page and Kay is a genius and she put it in like little boxes and made it super super easy to read and we put it in order with numbers so that we would always um, know the right order so we do the informal aphasia with the western aphasia battery which is here so you can just find this online this is a standardized assessment 
So we use that and it's laminated, which is awesome. Then we have the um, informal cognitive evaluation. So as you can see, there's different categories. So like uh, this is problem solving and then we have abstract thinking, convergent, uh, immediate and delayed recall, so all that stuff. Um, we used to do the slums and then we started doing the click it memory portion for cognitive. So we do the click it, memory portions, and then the informal, and then you log all of that. And then I also have this, which is from the slums, um, but I just use it for clock drawing for the click it memory. So how we decide what therapy to do is we'll look at the um, assessment. So in their assessment, maybe they had trouble with um, verbal fluency, uh, convergent thinking, math problems, and abstract thinking. The evaluation will have like all those categories on it and you just tally up how many they got wrong and how many they got right and give them the correct percentage. So then if they had trouble with all those things when you go into therapy, you just find materials that target those categories. But I never had to put in any patient goals. My supervisor would do that and then I would just do therapy based on the goals. But the goals reflect the evaluation that you do. Then I have this paper here. This is from one of the books. Uh, this is part of the Western aphasia battery. It's a picture. Um, you could use any picture that they, um, the patient has to describe and then a little story that the patient has to read and answer questions about to see how their comprehension is. Oh, I have some pictures for picture identification um, and then I have some words uh, if you need word identification or sentences to read. And I laminated both of those. That's all I have in my handy clipboard compartment for now. So we still have to look through my notebook so let me tell you what's in here in the front pocket i have some phonemic word finders that Kay found on the internet that we used with uh, a patient who has who had a, who has aphasia i have a copy of the click it memory portion thing in here then i also have the mocha because our my hospital does the mocha but actually the speech therapists do not do it the ot's do it but I wasn't sure, so I printed one out and laminated it just in case. So I have a copy of the Mocha, which I've never used. Um, I have the Cape V, which I would use to assess voice, but I've never actually had to do that. There was one voice assessment like two weeks ago, but my supervisor did it while I was writing notes, so I didn't have to do it. And then here is the slums, which we used to do, but now we do the click it. Um, so I just wrote a note on here, ask the baseline and previous speech therapy. So just make sure after your evaluation, you ask the patient, how do you think you did on these questions? Is this your baseline? Which means before onset of symptoms, um, was this how they would have answered the questions? Things like that. And then we updated our cognitive evaluation. So this is the old version of it, but now I use the new one. I have a sheet called Treatment Ideas by Deficit that my supervisor gave me. Epic uses smart text, which is like period and then WAB, Western Aphasia Battery, and it like inputs this smart text for you to fill out. So I have a smart text document, um, lots of notes I took on how to take notes. Now I don't have to even look at these anymore because I just know what to do, which is so cool. And then I have all the evaluations before um, K reformatted them to be easier for us to read. Um, then examples of notes, meal assessment, evaluations, all that stuff. Then I included some of my notes from class from dysphagia just because we do a lot of dysphagia therapy and evaluation at the hospital. So I was like, I might need these. So I literally just printed out my study guide that I had made for dysphagia. And I keep um, dysphagia notes about swallowing exercises in my clipboard because we use those constantly but other things like diet recommendations and things like that I'll just keep in here and I honestly haven't had to look at these notes very much because um, my supervisor will just answer my questions or I'll just observe and see what the hospital is doing but it's just nice to have them in case I ever have a question. And I have an information for students document that talks about stroke orders, intubated patients, tracheotomy patients, how to document tubes and drains, oxygen delivery methods, swallow studies, and medical abbreviations. So my supervisor gave me this document and it's been very helpful on the hospitals. Oh, and then diets and then HIPAA information, which no patient information can leave the hospital and don't text the name of patients. So if I ever have to text where I'm going, I'll text 
the room or the room number or something like that. And then total laryngectomy patients. So my supervisor gave me that just so that I could know what the hospital does because as I said, every hospital is different. So those are just all of the policies that um, the hospital I'm at uses for all of those things. So that's just information. Then a document about Epic, how to use it. Kay found this really cool packet on Teachers Pay Teachers with like cranial nerve information and uh, case history things and just like cute little graphics. Um, the, the PAS scale, so PAS scale, that's like saying scale scale. The penetration aspiration scale, so that is literally everything in this binder, which I honestly rarely open when I'm actually at the hospital because we're just moving all the time. So I hope that made sense. I know that was like a lot of information and it was kind of disorganized, but I literally just got home from work and I thought I'd sit down and film a little bit because I really hope that if you're going to an inpatient setting, this was a little bit helpful just to give you an idea of what every day looks like. I think the hardest thing for me in this placement was just being really uncomfortable all the time. I'm not comfortable in a hospital setting. I'm not used to being in a hospital. So when I was first there, I felt really out of place. I felt like I couldn't touch anything. I felt like I couldn't touch the patients. I felt weird talking to nurses. I felt, you know, dumb asking questions that I was like, you should know the answer to this. But as time went on, um, you observe things, just like absorb everything that you hear, listen to everything everyone's saying, ask your supervisor questions, take notes, learn from your mistakes so when you do something wrong, don't do it wrong again, and just try to absorb all of the learning that you can. And something that I realized that I think has been the biggest learning experience for me and the biggest change in the hospital setting was at the beginning I was so worried about me and my anxiety and you know looking dumb or messing up and doing well I wanted to be good clinician so I was like worried about me doing well but then halfway through the semester uh, it's shifted to how can I help the patient I'm not thinking about me anymore because I have experience with the assessments I have experience with bedsides with modifieds with fees um, with talking to patients' families. Um, I've done dysphagia therapy, cognitive therapy. I've done them by myself. I've done them with my supervisor in the room, so I know I can do them. I've done all these things. They were uncomfortable, but I did them. I know I can do them. And it shifts from thinking about you to thinking about the patient and what can you do for the patient. And I think that really, really changed my perspective. And it's when I really started enjoying working at an inpatient or not working. <laughs> I'm not getting paid. Uh, it's when I really started enjoying my placement at the inpatient hospital is when that mindset shift happened and I know that will happen for you at your placement as well. So just remember your first couple of weeks are going to be really hard because you're learning new things but that's not because you're not prepared or because you're dumb or because of anything that you're doing. It's because it's literally something new. You can't prepare for something that you've never done when it's so hands-on and so patient-oriented and different to every person. So that's all I have to share about my inpatient hospital setting. Please let me know in the comments if you have any questions and I'll try to answer them. I hope this is helpful to any future SLPs out there. I know that I'm going to be at a school in the fall. I don't know what kind of school helping for elementary uh, but I know I'm gonna be in that uncomfortable place again I'm just learning all new things because I'm gonna have to go from hospital very clinical to kids so just remember that um, you're really smart you're working hard and you're gonna be an amazing clinician if you just put the patient first and you always think about what's best for them okay I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see y'all next week for another video bye guys